Cool. Well, Colin, again, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Colin Strauss. I'm a visual effects supervisor and director. Awesome. I love it. And I was curious, like, um, I guess for you early in your career, did you always imagine you would be in some kind of creative industry growing up? Yeah, like when I was pretty young, like me and my brother used to make little Lego stop motion movies with like a Super 8 camera. That's where we first started. And then I remember we got an Amiga, an Amiga 2000. God, that had to be like sixth grade, I think. You're rocking video I mean, it's going toaster way back. or something like that. <laughs> that was actually was pre-video toaster, I think. That was right before the video toaster came out. And I remember like, you know, just getting into everything. And then when Jurassic Park and Terminator 2 came out, by that point, I'd already been into doing digital art and I loved where that was going. But Terminator 2 specifically was the movie that was like, this is what we want to do with the rest of our lives. Like just seeing that in the screen, dragged our mom twice to the theaters to watch it. And it was just such a game changing experience to see something like that brought to life in ways that never had been done before. I love that because, um, yeah, I, I guess for me, I've kind of recently been trying to figure out what the catalyst was, because I mean, it's always Jurassic Park and T2 for, I think, our generation. But um, I think for me, it was also video games like Doom and Wolfenstein kind of like Get, getting in the the video game angle but then bit by bit realizing well i can't do cool stuff like this on you know a bunch of sprites so it kind of segued into that eventually yeah duke nukem too that was a very uh influential game i've been trying to dig up apparently there's like a voxel pack for it now and i'm, I'm trying to find the time to sit down and uh, i'm too stupid to figure out how to get it all installed and set up but yeah i specifically want to go down that path again because used to make all the maps and you know replace all the graphics and all that kind of stuff back in the day i'm curious too like for you when did you first get into visual effects like um was there again like getting into the amiga and everything else like how quickly did you migrate into working in the industry i mean <laughs> Professionally, probably started, I think it was either freshman or sophomore year in high school, where we, at that point, I was, we had Sculpt Animate 4D. Um, there, was a Disney, there was a Disney painting animation tool. There was, was it Vision Paint, I think. There's a couple of these old programs that we had. And I believe we had just, about, I think we had just got a video toaster. So it was just starting to learn Lightwave at that point. And we started just cold calling production companies in the yellow pages because that's back when the flying logos were like that was like the new thing <laughs> everyone wanted a flying logo for their law firm for their commercial line and i remember the first job we did we got like it was like 200 bucks mm -hmm. you know and it was just like but for us like you know a basement that was like Amazing. huge so <laughs> and then we just kind of just started building it from there and then i think you know by the time i was junior in high school i kind of knew i looked to go into colleges but like you know, Columbia University, you had to do two years of gen ed before they would even let you touch the lab. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's like, you know, like I already have a bunch of computers at my house. I'm already doing stuff like why would I take two years off to do a bunch of stuff I didn't really give a shit about. So it was kind of like at that point, I realized well, I'm probably not going to do college. And then my dad got laid off from IBM. So then we basically I think that was I think it was probably 18 I think at this point and then we took his retirement fund and we convinced my parents to buy us an SGI Indie with the absolute stripped down version of Power Animator. Jeez that's an investment. Yeah that was a uh, that was pretty much every penny we had but uh we just took that computer and we just started hustling mm -hmm. and then that's when we first moved out to LA and because not a lot of people had their own SGI machine yeah. back in those days. It's a pretty small group of freelancers that were kind of jumping around between all the different projects that got us on to the uh we did a movie called the stupids it was a john landis film that was the first movie i worked on and then that got us on to doing the x files and i remember did uh one of the first shots i did in the x files was the invisible man who drowned the female colonel in the swimming pool i remember that and i think i was still in i was still in high school doing that shot and um yeah and then basically just kind of took off from there and it's always been you and your brother working together uh, in tandem most of the time. Yep. Yep. Always, always together, directing together. The only real times we kind of went different ways was like if when I was supervising San Andreas mm -hmm. and Rampage, those were ones where I just got loaned out, but that's because he was running the company back home. 
And then that way I was basically loaned out from hydraulics to go and be the production supervisor on those two projects. And yeah, I'd love to talk a bit about hydraulics. Like for you guys, like uh, I'm curious, when was kind of the moment that you guys decided to launch a studio? Was it, you know, just the right opportunity came along and it just made sense? Or for you, what was the catalyst there? Well, we had another company called Pixel Envy that we did with a couple other partners, but we had a falling out with one of the partners. So then the three of us that were together basically split off and then formed our own thing. And I, and I remember we did it right when Men in Black 2 was coming out. Because the right. first job, before even Hydraulics had a name, we were working on the Men in Black 2 music video for Will Smith. Completely forgot about Pixel Envy. You guys did like Corn and all these other music videos back in the day. Because I would always nerd out on Oh, yeah. Like, and uh, yeah, it was like, again, just back then it was so scarce to see cool CGI. So uh, anything kind of stood out. So um, yeah, i could fond of a lot of the stuff you guys were doing back then. You know, I, I gotta say, I missed the music video days. That was some fun stuff. That was like, because there was so much money and there was so much creative control and the directors kind of got to do whatever they wanted and everyone wanted to do that new thing that no one's ever seen before, which was literally how every phone call started <laughs> when you talked to these guys. And that was cool. And look, there was a lot of amazing directors came out of that era. I mean, you had, you know, between, from Michael Bay to Francis Lawrence to David Fincher to like mm -hmm. all of these guys all came out of that same sort of time period because they gave directors a lot of freedom and let them try things in music videos and commercials that you would, you know, that no one had actually even tried in a movie. And I think that's where you got some really, really cool, you know, some just really great talent came out of that sort of time period. You're absolutely right. You can think of so many different directors who cut their teeth back then doing music videos and then obviously, you know, land a, a feature or two and never look back. But um, yeah, I, again, it's just, it's also a fun time. I can't tell you a, a recent music video I've ever seen. But back then, like anything that came out that was interesting, you'd always be fixated on that for a long time. Yeah, I mean, they spent money too. I remember like, you only have like three or four days to shoot it. Mm -hmm. So you get every single toy. You want helicopter, you want two helicopters, two techno cranes, four stages at Universal. Like you get whatever you wanted back in those days. And now it's like, you know, I hear people work on music videos, like we have like, 80 grand and you're like jesus that wouldn't even cover the dp in those old days you know like for what their day rates were so it's pretty mind-blowing um because that was it like i've seen some people recently where it's like we got 10k just because it's again it's kind of it's going to be your resume so a lot of people just kind of leaned into that a lot so i think that kind of crushed it like if you live in new york you'd make music videos and you know you'd be starving the whole time i won't mention the artists um since we're not talking privately, but like just recently, there's a couple of music videos that were hitting seven figures that uh, one of my buddies was directing. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, oh, cool. Like maybe they're coming back again. But I hadn't heard of anything that was, you know, anything above 100K in a very long time. Yeah, I haven't either. I mean, we've been kind of out of that scene now for so long, but it's, I feel like I don't even, I can't remember the last music video I've actually watched of anything yeah, new. Same. You know, I like, <laughs> listen to a lot of music, like you're listening to it all the time, but they're just it isn't a thing anymore to go and like tune into trl and see the new drop that was happening every friday those days sadly you know sadly are gone jumping around a little bit um i was curious too with hydraulics like what were some of the big memorable projects that you guys look back on um in terms of just whether it was early days like some of the more ambitious things or even just some of the yeah big experiences taking on bigger projects than you had in the past probably some of the coolest projects we did i'd say like 300 was really fun because that was before we moved into our the bigger office space when we were in Santa Monica for years. You're on Second Street, I think, because I used to go to Bar Chloe, uh, which is next door. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were right above. But before there, we were out of a couple units uh, off of Montana, like mm -hmm. kind of like Montana Euclid area, and so we were doing 300 there, and that was like one of those cool projects where like you never seen anything like that before. And we got to do some really cool stuff. We got I got to go up there and kind of sort of unofficially help, you know, shoot some of the stuff for the, our, our battle scene. Um, you know, so we got to do all the elephants and the rhinos, pretty much what they called battle two. We did that whole chunk of the movie. And that was just a really cool thing. Cause even when I see the movie on TV still today, like that work really holds up great. Uh, yeah, I'm really, I mean, the stuff we did in San Andreas was amazing. Day After Tomorrow, that was a, I mean, I know there was a lot of 
wackiness behind that project with all the <laughs> drama that went on with it, but it was still like, you know, pulling off that opening sequence, which was like 3,400 frames long or some, I forget what it was, some insane length for that opening shot. And the the tiny amount of time that we had was with such a, with only a couple people was, th those are a couple of things that's fun to look back and be like, yeah, we did that. And, and you know, even the stuff on Avatar, you know, we didn't do a lot in Avatar, but you know, that we did the opening sequence when he first wakes up inside the spaceship and that's some pretty cool stuff so i just watched the movie uh with my daughter she's turning seven and like she loves avatar now she's watched it three times she's seen the second one mm -hmm. but it was just neat because like you know you know being able to be like worked on one of her favorite movies and so most that's, people that's don't even know about cg they everyone just assumes live action because yeah it doesn't really stand out as um kind of breaking that illusion so again job well done yeah, and it was tricky because that was the opening scene in the movie. So it was kind of like, I remember, it was like, you fuck these up. And it's like, you know, like that starts the movie off in a bad place. So there was a lot of pressure to make that sequence really, really work. And you know, very, very, very proud of that. That's those shots still, and they were hard too with the 3D. And I mean, they only had like three real people in that shot. Everyone else was hand animated and all the cloth sims. And yeah, that was, a, that was some tricky stuff. A bit. Um, yeah, I'm actually supervising a show right now, which I'm kind of going through kind of similar painstaking stuff. So I'm eager to build out a mocap studio next month, which I'm hoping might make life a little bit easier. Again, like I think you and your brother have had a really fascinating career and it's, it's also inspiring for other visual effects artists to see some of the things that you guys have done. How did you guys first get involved in directing? Obviously, you've done uh, a lot of different stuff, features as well as music videos. So like, what was the first big project you guys landed? You know, it was a lot of like element and second unit type stuff for Francis Lawrence on the on the music video days. What was it? There was like a Ricky Martin music video, and it was kind of like, here's a camera and some special effects guys go shoot fire elements, and it's just like, oh, okay, and like you know, so you just go and just kind of fucking figure it out, and you know, so we kept doing that, and then it was uh, one of the producers that actually was producing a lot of Francis's music videos. Her husband was starting a production company and that was, they were like, well, you guys, you guys already have the visual effects department, you know, like you guys are really creative. She's like, and you're already been on set. Like, you know how it kind of works and you're moving cameras around and shooting stuff. She's like, why don't you do this yourself? And we were like, ah, no, we're not ready. And then she's like, well, we have a $700,000 music video that no one else wants to do. Cause at that point, 700 grand was like a shitty cheap <laughs> music video. <laughs> Sadly. Um, and uh, we were like, okay. And we we literally wrote this treatment for this vitamin C video. We put a Ferrari in it. We did all I mean, we just put like a bunch of like random shit in there. Didn't really know what the hell we were doing. And, but it was fun. And it was like, you know, trying to figure out how to write the treatment for the first time. Cause you know, when a lot of people don't realize we get to write this like two page fluff piece basically for what you're going to direct. But then it really depends on who you're writing it for, because sometimes if you write it too technical and you're trying to be really specific and then certain artists read it and they're just like, I don't know what the hell this is. And then if you're too amorphous with it, then it's just like, you know, then so other people are like, well, this guy is not specific and they obviously don't know what they're doing. So we don't know what we're going to get. So it was, it was a real interesting lesson trying to figure out like, how, because you had to write for your audience. You know, figure out we'd write one treatment for the record executive, but then there'd be a different treatment for the artists and depends if it was a single artist or a band. And you just started kind of learning. There's a lot of things of directing that's not behind the camera. You know, that's behind the camera is kind of the easier part. It's all the other setup, all the prep, picking the outfits, figuring out what shoes they're going to wear and what, you know, and then all the lighting stuff. And it was just, you know, and I think those music videos were fun because they were a crash course and everything like you know i think one music video would equal probably four years of film school mm -hmm. uh because you basically see every discipline you get to go through every part of the job and you also have to kind of sink or swim so you have to learn really quick you know at that point once we got into that then we got really you know we, we kind of found our our stride and then our third video we did was for lincoln park which got us nominated for best directors at the MTV Awards. So it was like, I don't know, it was fun. Like I, like I said, I miss shooting that stuff. That was, there were so many cool things that you could do back in those days. And we worked with such amazing DPs. I don't know, it was, it was just kind of cool.
I love it. Um, yeah, and I guess like for from there, like transitioning into feature film, like how did you guys first get involved in that? That was just from our relationships with Fox. They were our biggest customer at uh, at Hydraulics. So we were just doing so much for them. And then at that point, they had this movie coming up on our agent that was end up talking to one of the executives who were, we were working with a lot. And they're like, look, you guys got this, you know, you don't have it. Like they want, they knew they wanted to do the movie for like almost 20 million, 30 million less than the first movie. Mm -hmm. So they don't, even though the first one did very well, they were like, they wanted to, you know, unfortunately do this one in a really tiny little box. And so a lot of normal people wouldn't have taken it on. And they're like, there's no way you're going to get a movie, make a movie like that look big if you don't have someone that knows how to pull off the visual effects properly. And so we went in and, you know, did a pitch and they basically hired us in the room. And I think that was when we were working on Fantastic Four 2, I believe, at about the same time. I was going to bring up um, James Cameron, how he pitched Aliens uh, to Fox back in the day. Do you know this story? No, I don't. I had to Google this multiple times because I was like, it's it's too gangster to, to be true. But um, yeah, he basically was coming off of uh, directing Terminator, which was, you know, besides Piranha 2 in Italy, was his first real feature. And um, Fox knew that he wanted to go and pitch doing a sequel to Alien and they didn't want to do it. But they were like, OK, well, we'll hear him out and then we'll pitch the, the shows we think that he should be doing. And um, apparently he just wrote alien on the blackboard and then put an S next to it and then put two vertical stri strikes through the, the S to make the dollar sign. And obviously that he was talking to the right audience there, as you would <laughs> say earlier. I, I thought that was the best picture I've ever heard in my life. And um, yeah, apparently that's how I <laughs> convinced them like, hey, I'm, I'm uh, fully aligned with what your goals are too. So let's go make a film. <laughs> and it made pretty much the best movie ever made. Yeah. And again, like, um, what was that experience like? Because in a lot of ways, I feel like uh, Requiem was a lot more ambitious in terms of, you know, what was happening, let's say, versus uh, the original AVP, which I just felt, you know, it's a bit more of a constrained story and, and location. So um, for you guys, like, obviously, you have a lot of experience working visual effects. You've got your studio as well, which I'm sure could have helped having those resources and knowing where your strengths are. What was it like um, directing that film and, and going through the whole experience? You know, it was a hard one because we had pitched a version of the film and then sort of, I think the most politically nice way of saying it, systematically through the process of prep and everything, almost all the changes we got were kind of being undone. So we prepped one film and then when it finally came time to roll, it had been kind of pushed back into this direction that we didn't like. and. And it's hard because like you're trying, you know, it's like you get put in this tough spot as a director and also you're the vendor. So it's like, it's a big job and you're doing other jobs. And then you're like, you're trying to like juggle all the politics. And when do you put your foot down? And when do you tow the company line? And like, you know, just, and we were just trying to juggle it. And there was, and there was things too, like where, you know, like people didn't know the movie was R rated until Rothman did some interview and said the movie was R rated. But we were, I think we were already prepping, like we were like a week out from shooting or something. And we're like, we didn't even know the rating of the film. Like, so it, it, there were some things that made it challenging. There were some things that were, that weren't really good on the film. You know, like, I mean, we did the whole movie for $39 million. Like, I mean, it was a tiny budget, you know, and I think it did well, like 124 or something like that worldwide. And then uh, another huge chunk on DVD. The DVD sales, I think, were 60, 80 million or something like that. Like, so it, you know, look, it made, it made them money. So, but it was, it was tough. You know, like the first movie is always a meat grinder. You know, like there's always that process of, can you get what you want? And then, but there's also, there's a lot of masters on a project like that. You know, there's a lot of executives and a lot of notes. And so it, you know, look, it, it made it tricky. And it was one of the reasons why we went to do Skyline independently afterwards, because we just wanted to kind of figure out and understand the process for ourselves a little bit better. Because there's a lot of things that were happening that we didn't quite understand the logic of and we felt like the only way of really learning it better was just to do it ourselves roll up our sleeves figure out how to finance it ourselves produce it ourselves you know negotiate the actor deals negotiate the distribution deals like just all of that stuff and making a shitty movie is really hard making a good movie is almost impossible so it's like there's just a lot of things that 
you learn, uh, you know, like things that sound good on the page that don't work as good on camera, or when, you know, when you have something that's perfect on the page, but then the actors can't bring that to life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you're running out of, you're running out of time. Like, do you kill your day and try to get this one scene perfect or, you know, but if you don't make your day, you know, especially like on a, on a studio picture, you know, you have the line producer of all these people that are reporting everything every day. So if you don't make your day, then they can be like, well, you know, that favorite that they find kind of find your favorite scene. And then they push that to the end of the schedule. And it's like, if you don't do good on these days, well, that scene, we might not have time for that scene. So it's like, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tricky stuff there. And then I get it too, because also, you know, we ran a commercial production company for a while and we had other directors and, and then when you wear the other shoe, you're also kind of like, oh yeah, I get it. Like, you know, like you can't just fuck off on this one scene when we have to get the whole thing and, you know, so get the whole thing and then get your special stuff. So there's, there's a lot of learning to that. And, you know, I think probably the most frustrating thing and the one thing that probably makes us both the most upset with the AVP situation was the color of the Blu-ray. Hmm. The digital, you the digital ver the, the version of that movie you can watch today is unwatchably dark. It isn't how we color corrected it. It isn't what we said in the DI. And it looked great on print. It's a dark movie. It was supposed to be dark. I mean, we hired you know, the fucking DP from Texas, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre to shoot it. We wanted it gritty and dark but it wasn't supposed to be so dark you couldn't see the creatures. And on film, the movie worked and so they, something got screwed up in the Blu-ray and and they never sent us a proof of the Blu-ray and then we got the final Blu-ray and I thought we were supposed to see a proof and we watch it and our jaws drop because the movie was so fucking dark that you can't watch it. And it's even with my kids, I, I haven't even watched it with them because I'm like, I, I don't want to watch the movie that dark. And I was hoping one of these days they would come back around and remaster it and fix the mistake. Like it almost looks like the movie got double leaded is kind of what happened. And it's, but you know, I don't know until they do that. Like that, that's probably our biggest frustration. You know, I just wish it looked the way it looked on film. I'll have AVP two stops, <laughs> two stops up. Well, uh, I, two stops, I know it is. It's it literally is AVP two stops under. It's like, that's, <laughs> Yeah, because in the sewer battle, you know, we, I mean, you know, Daniel lit it so nice with the aliens hiding up in the roof of the sewer. And then you watch it on, on the digital version and it's it's just digital clamped out black. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, oh, that's not how it was supposed to be. And that was, and I remember we would, we would even drive around LA spot checking the movie theaters and making sure, because, you know, some movie theaters, they run the ball, but stop and a half under to, you know, save hours on their projector. And so we would be looking at places and, and it always looked great on film. And then, I don't know, that's probably my biggest regret. I just wish, I wish we had a version of the movie that everyone else could see who, you know, that represented the theatrical version of it. It's going to be pretty gut-wrenching, uh, I'm sure. Again, talking a little bit about um, some of the other stuff, again, like Skyline being a, a good example. What was that whole experience like? Because again, this is your baby rather than uh, a very protected IP um, from, you know, way down the line. Like, what was it like doing something unique and being a lot more invested, raising the money and going through that whole experience? Look, it was pretty fun. There was a lot of also interesting lessons you learn. Like, it's really hard to get foreign uh, markets that ever pay up and other interesting things on the financing side that you go through stuff. But, you know, as a, just as a creative thing, it was fun to do our own thing. I mean, we literally shot at my brother's condo, you know, like every morning the crew would show up and they're like having to shower and like <laughs> get, get ready before everyone basically barges in on them. Um, but it was, a uh, you know, like it, look, it was cool. And it was like, it's over a thousand shots. And that was the other cool thing was like, we just built such an amazing pipeline with our, you know, with our animation publishing, model publishing, this whole mental ray thing that we had built. And then, you know, and I, and I was, a, you know, a, during the day was editing, but then I also did all the look dev and all the CG creatures and, and I was doing all the lighting. And, and it was cool because we just had this really small team bang out a thousand shots, like, you know, in just a couple months. And, you know, at a really, I think it was a, still holds up at a really good quality, you know, and it was like, that was, pretty awesome it's pretty mm -hmm. awesome seeing that it's pretty awesome going to comic-con and 
playing the trailer there. We got to go to Hall C and do the big presentation. Like, you know, that was some pretty cool stuff. Like that was, that was some fun experiences. You know, it's, it, look, I mean, every job has its ups and downs. Every job's a learning lesson. But I think the best thing about it was just, we got so well rounded on, because we bought all the cameras, we bought all the lenses, we bought all the lights. We just bought all the shit because we wanted to understand how it worked. Because sometimes we feel like on jobs, like, you know, you get a line producer and it's like, oh, you can't, you know, I remember like an an AVPR after the nuke went off, we wanted ash raining down because nuke just vaporized the town. And they were like, ah, can't do it at 75 grand. Can't do ash. And it was like, and then you find out at the end, we were like, we were like seven figures under on our shooting budget. And we're like, we're under, but we then didn't get to put ash in the ending scene of the movie that was only 75 grand. And like, that was again, one of those things where we're just like, it didn't compute in our brain, like how, you know, now in the end it worked out good because being under, we then got to shoot the predator homeworld scene, which wasn't originally in the script. And we got to add that in because we were able to, you know, basically take that underage and, you know, shoot some new stuff. So, you know, it worked out, but it was like, we just wanted to understand like, well, how does that, you know, like, how's that work? And how do we like, and how do you balance that? Line producers have a tough job. They, they're always, they have, you know, they have to be responsible to the studio, but then they're also, you know, they got to try to give the director everything they want, but then also sometimes you know, directors do crazy shit and you got to also put them in a box and make sure, you know, make sure they're not spilling out everywhere. So, you know, I think after Skyline, I just felt like we had such a great grasp of everything. And I think that really helped when going into San Andreas, because, you know, when they brought me in as a supervisor, you know, I didn't just come in as a VFX supervisor. I could look at every scene and every setup as a producer, as a director, and then ended up actually directing most of the second unit for San Andreas. We had a second unit director, but he was only in the States. So we didn't have one in Australia. So I ended up directing everything that we're shooting down on the Gold Coast. But because I had, because with Skyline, we just ran everything. Like I knew how all the equipment worked. I knew exactly what lights I needed. I could grab a little splinter. And while Brad was shooting main unit, I could grab like one of the main actresses or a couple of times even grab DJ and like put him on the side of a helicopter and line up the shot and like, and just get it all. And then was able to kind of AD and produce my own little mini unit it changed the way that movie went because we were able to get so much more shooting done at the same time because I could supervise and splinter and mm-hmm. it was just like a force multiplier. And then we basically applied that same thing to Rampage and, you know, being able to, you know, I shot like a huge amount of the second, you know, all the stuff in Chicago, the whole, you know, with all the soldiers and everything that takes place physically in Chicago. You know, I was shooting five days a week in Atlanta and then me and Aaliyah, who was like my number two on the on the movie, uh, we would both fly up to Chicago and then I would prep and then direct all weekend, fly back Sunday night, then do another five days in Atlanta, fly out Friday night, shoot two days in Chicago. I mean, it was crazy. We did like 40, God, was it 46 days or something like that straight, not a day off for either of us. We just pushed through running both units and supervising and the directing and, you know, and it was, uh, but it was because of all those previous experiences on AVP and Skyline that I felt really confident in running a department like that. And, you know, cause in Skyline, we had soldiers, we had guns on set, we had all these things, same thing in AVP. We had a lot of like firing 50 cals and all these other weapons. So on Rampage, like I've already worked with all of this sort of equipment already did stuff with helicopters and hiring pilots and, you know, helping manage that stuff. So it just really has been like, you know, like I said, it's just been great learning lessons. And then now like on fire country, you know, trying to take all of these lessons from these big movies, they're bringing me on the project. I, you know, I was trying to figure out how do I boil this down into something that we can complete an episode because in some episodes, we only have two to three weeks. Some of the bigger ones, maybe four to six, but it's like, it's a tight production, but you know, we're doing anywhere between 80 to 150 shots an episode. That was a, really the big thing was like taking all of these previous lessons and then finding a way of coming up with a battle plan on basically, you know, like an episodic, you know, TV show 
and and getting feature level work out of it that you know is a little bit different than what you get on a lot of normal broadcast television like you know on the hbo shows and other things we only have 10 episodes you can put a lot more into it and you get a lot more time but when you're trying to bust out 22 episodes you know and it's like it gets it gets tricky but you know running shows that were over a thousand shots you know like i think you know san andreas was was it 1200 shots rampage was maybe 1400 you know so it's like being you know managing multiple vendors and multiple things coming onto this just felt very natural to me so and it's actually been pretty it's been pretty fun to like bring in this sort of level of work to a broadcast show and you know and and it seems like it's working i mean the show's ratings have been fantastic they picked up the second season everyone seems really happy i'm just happy to try to you know help elevate it as much as we can and you know make the show as good as we can yeah i haven't checked it out yet but it looks fantastic i'm actually quite eager to uh carve out some time and and binge it at some point so again congratulations on season two as well thank you I was curious, like with Fire Country, when did you first get involved with that show? So yeah, CBS VFX brought me on almost exactly a year ago. They needed some newer supervisors at the company. So I had someone I knew that was working there, introduced me to Craig who uh, runs it. And they brought me in and they said, hey, we might be bidding on this big Bruckheimer TV show that's coming up. And, you know, they know that they, they wanted, you know, someone that's worked with disaster type stuff. And I'm like, well, I've done tons of fire on these last two movies. So I got a, got a pretty good grasp of how that works. And then, so I ended up flying up there for the pilot. So uh, we it was up in Vancouver. So was up there and then we basically have the CBS VFX team, which has been absolutely awesome. Uh, primarily based out of LA, but then there's a bunch of little satellites that run out of it as well, kind of all around the globe. And and then basically, you know, we we shoot up there, post kind of remote, and then uh, we put everything together at the main office in LA. And then um, I have a supervisor, uh, Joel, who used to work at Hydraulics with us. Uh, he's my on set now. So while, when the season, so once the season kind of got kicked in, you know, I'm, you know, cause I have to be working on almost three or four episodes simultaneously in all different aspects from prepping one to shoot you know, looking at the dailies coming on the next one to turnover on a third and wrapping up post on a fourth so it's like it's the overlap gets pretty crazy so i end up bringing joel in to be my onset uh eyes and ears so i'll do all the prep meetings and then i'll down i'll come up kind of with the battle plan then i'll talk about that with joel and then joel's my my trooper on set that he just you know figures shit out like you know we have our plan but if things change he's really smart and he knows how to make that stuff happen and then from there we get the turnover down with our la team and then uh luciano's my producer and caprice is and uh kind of in charge of 3d and then between them uh with eric and mario who's our two other main people in the 3d department we just break everything out uh, I go through and literally one of the things we do is we just draw on every shot. So I take screenshots of every shot that comes in, draw where all the effects are, where the fire is supposed to be, where the smoke is. I mean, they look like a kindergartner drew it, but they're generally quick little drawings I'll do on my iPad. But they've been great because I can send them the editorial really fast. So we're getting turnover. We can send those out. Everyone can see how the fire builds and where it gets bigger and how wide the smoke is. And that completely changed the way they're used to looking at it because they would always wait till the visual effects come in at the end. But now we're handing them all these sort of kind of quick concept frames at the beginning. We get the producers that actually sign off on it up front. So that way when we start simulations and everything, at least everyone's kind of looked at it. And then I've mapped it out, you know, just kind of trying to bring my creative brain to what the editors and the directors are trying to do and figure out like, okay, well, how do I help tell this story for them? Like if the fire is supposed to be spreading from point A to point B, what are all the things that we can do to help bring up the tension and, you know, bring up the drama and also make sure things are physically done correct so that the fire is behaving right, you know, cause we're using a lot of filmed elements, special effects, you know, when they can gives us very good in-camera elements, but we did have some funny things where we started shooting the show and then they had real forest fires up in Vancouver, and then we couldn't shoot fire at all anymore. 
So we're shooting a fire show. We got we got shut down one day where an actual fire was starting to get, you know, I think it was within like a mile or two of the location and they had to get everyone out of there. For a couple episodes, we had to do CG fire only. Mm-hmm. So a lot of Houdini, Houdini simulations and stuff. And then, um, but you know, so then we just started like on those first couple episodes, we basically built sort of our recipe box. So then we figured out, okay, now we know how how fire can be done. We can either have interactive blinking LEDs that the DPs place for nighttime shots or even daytime shots, at least so if we can't plumb uh, the propane lines there, at least put a light there so the actors know there's something there. And then we get a real little in-camera flare, you get the proper bloom over, also helps us figure out what the exposure is gonna be. And then if we can get real fire in camera, we obviously always take that and then whether we augment on top or we build around it, depending on the shot. But, you know, we've kind of got this whole shorthand down and and the crew, we have two full crews that are shooting every other episode. Mm -hmm. And it's great because every, you know, but it's the same stunts, same special effects. And then, and then also with Joel, with with the visual effects on set, everyone has that shorthand now on how to do this stuff. So it's actually been making the episodes go a lot faster. The directors can shoot quicker. We do almost no blue screen at all on the show. Every shots, I'd say 95% of the shots are handheld, you know, big, you know, big moves and that. Cause that was the other thing too, is like, I, I told them like, let's just break the camera. Don't like, I don't want that TV lock off. Like that to me is kind of like the death shot. So, you know, unless there's something where like an episode has four days to post and you know, we'll add some handheld on top. You know, we might have like one or two of those, but generally speaking, we try to let the, the the director and the DP have a lot of freedom in, you know, moving the camera, not feeling limited by stuff. And then again, by having those lights and things, it just helps create this atmosphere for the actors so they know what they're supposed to be reacting to. Because, you know, it's, it's really cold in Vancouver right now, but when you're near that much fire, it's like, your flesh is boiling off. So, you know, you got to really make sure that the actors are in the scenes and look at Max has been absolutely awesome. And, you know, and it's like the whole, the whole cast has been great. And I, I, and I think that's why, again, you know, the show has been doing good because it feels like everything's firing on all cylinders right now. That's awesome. Lighting things on fire is definitely a sensitive topic and especially on the West coast. Uh, it's gotten to the point now where I walk outside and it's really like in summertime, if, if the, the sun's a little bit too gold. I just, I'm like, okay, I guess uh, things are on fire in my neighborhood somewhere. You know, it's just, you kind of get used to it now, sadly. For you guys, like, um, how much did you rely on digital fire? As you mentioned, Houdini, uh, for instance, like, was that a quick conversation to kind of start leaning into? Well, I'll tell you one funny story before I answer that, which is one of the first meetings I did on the show. I'm, cause I'm in Irvine, I'm right on the edge of the mountain here. And I remember doing the first Zoom with everyone and my whole living room went orange. <laughs> and I remember, but I was so focused on the meeting, but my brain was going like, that's fucking weird. Cause the sun sets over mm-hmm. there, but you know, it's like, it shouldn't be orange in the middle of the day. Like it's kind of the morning. So why is my whole living room orange? And I came out and there's a fire a couple miles from here. <laughs> and it yeah. turns out, I didn't realize where I moved, the fire had gotten less than a mile from my house like two years ago. So I like literally moved like right by where, you know, literally in the fire country, basically. And luckily there is a Cal Fire helicopter. The the big helicopter base is like 200 yards from our house. So I'm hoping if anything does happen here, we at least have the choppers like right next, right next to us. But like overall, I would say, you know, we're using like, like live action fire elements for probably 70% of the shots. Mm -hmm. You know, and then it's the really tricky ones. Like uh, episode 105 was inside a barn. And so you have like the inner, you know, the top roof of the barn and there's no 2D elements aren't gonna work for that. Cameras running around all over the place. Like, and so at that point we, you know, we LIDAR everything. So while we're shooting, um, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, we have a, uh, a big LIDAR unit that scans all the stuff. So we get all of the, the set data, and then we're able to basically rebuild out the interior of that, and then we would give it to our main uh, Houdini artist, and they would just go through and build these fire sims. You know, that one was probably more like 70% CG fire. 
Uh, cause we also had a hole that had a collapse in the top of the barn and we needed flames to kind of come out and around all of the beams. But then a lot of the other ones where it's more like traditional, like in a forest, you know, we have a, you know, we filmed some elements. We also just have a great library of fire elements that we have. And then what we try to do, which was the same theory that uh, Barry and I came up with on San Andreas and Rampage, which was like anything within 20 feet of camera should always be done, in, you know, if we can, should always be done in camera. And then don't worry about the stuff beyond that. So that, you know, especially if you want to move quick. So special effects will always try to help us with those close up shots. So like in the pilot, there's a scene of the actor running and there's these trees that are burning that are falling. And those were actually rigged trees. They actually made these metal trees and put real branches on it. And we actually had these things falling, but then all the fires on the trees around it, we did as uh, as our element fires, because, you know, it's basically from a safety thing, like the thing that we could control, you know, and then actually have a volume knob on, we wanted, you know, we, we'll try to do in camera. If it's something, you know, cause Vancouver is very sensitive about obviously us burning down any of their, their, you know, their <laughs> nice forests. So there's always a lot of, depending on where we shoot, there's a lot of like local provincial, you know, like, Preventional uh, limitations. Each city's different. Each fire department will let you do different things. Sometimes we can have a flame bar, but it has to be on a flame board six inches in the air. So in that case, we'll use that fire more like a great interactive lighting tool and also lets us figure out what the wind was doing on the day and the exposure, right? Because then when you get it and there's real wind and, and you see the, how, the, how fast the flame is moving, then we don't have to go and try to guess or go to the director or the producers and go like, do you like this fire speed? Or do you like this fire speed? It's like, no, you filmed real fire in camera. Everything we're doing is matching that. That's been really helping us from a streamlining standpoint. Because when the producers and everyone feel really good when they look at it and they go like, oh, well, that's real fire, right? That's how bright real fire is. That's how real fire move. And as long as our stuff matches that, then they know they got something real. Yeah, and and I remember that that was a big thing with Brad on on the uh, on San Andreas and that where he always you know he just for him the death would be a green person in front of a green screen you know with nothing real to ground it like even if we replaced ninety percent of it you know he was like just put a person on a real sidewalk with a real background we'll smash the building afterwards but at least I have the real person real lighting real bounce real fill and the camera operators are are lining up better because everything's real so that's where we can, when we can get the real fire it's definitely been a huge help for us because i think they frame up differently on it when they see it because sometimes the flames get bigger than you think and you actually have to get the camera a little bit lower and a little more dramatic so but you know like right now it's really cold in vancouver so you know there's limitations to uh you know like making sure things don't freeze up you know like we've had issues where like with the water, like you got firefighters spraying water down. If it gets too cold, they can't actually run the water out mm. of the hose. So we've been having to do some CG water spray in a few scenes just because the temperature was too cold to safe, you know, to safely spray around water, or also they don't want water to accidentally hit another actor and people get hypothermia and all that other fun stuff. So it's, yeah, it's tricky because you're doing a lot of nighttime shooting in the rain or snow is it's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, I bet. Um, but it's pretty fascinating to, to hear all that. And I'm curious too, like, so stepping away from fire, like what were some of the biggest challenges on fire country from a visual effects standpoint? The biggest challenge, first one was just speed. Like trying to get as many shots, basically trying to give them as many shots as possible in the short amount of time that we have. And really streamlining that process of turnover giving notes to all of the artists, having consistency on all of the stuff, everyone using the same elements. Like that was probably kind of complexity number one. The other complexity is all the non-fire episodes. You know, we had one where there's a walk, a sky bridge that collapsed in episode three, I think, that collapsed down. There was a helicopter repelling episode, which was a uh, 106, which was a very different thing. There's no fires in that, but it was like all these CG cliff extensions and CG helicopters and ropes breaking. We also did one where we did a fully CG river where we filmed on a real bridge, but the, there was no water down below. So we had to, we actually went in the Terrigen and built the whole 3D terrain 
underneath the bridge and then did a whole Houdini simulation and then had to have a car, a CG car, then fall into the bridge, splash and sink. And, you know, there was like probably a dozen shots, I believe, of the CG water in that episode. Mm -hmm. And those were all huge sims, you know, millions of particles because all the, because they wanted kind of white water rapids sort of vibe. And that was just hard because we only had a couple weeks. So one of the things we've been trying to do is like, okay, if we know that episode's coming up, even if we don't know what's in the episode, we can at least go to the dynamics team and go like, okay, here's kind of the location. We got to start R and D and stuff. Cause then the second I get the LIDAR, you're going to start like, you know, then you can start R and D off the LIDAR while they're doing their assembly cut. And then once we get the director's cut, then we do our early turnover where we just pick a handful of shots to at least get the big ones kind of in progress. And then by that point, hopefully we got the sim baked out and then, you know, again, come up with ideas of like, we'll do it only two sims, one sim looking up river, one sim looking down river and just, and just trying to come up with those smart plans with all the artists before, you know, we get into it. Cause sometimes, you know, I feel like you know, when, when production schedule is really short, you know, if you don't have a good grasp over, you know, I don't want to call it micromanaging, but like you kind of have to make sure all the little pieces are thought out well so that that way when, you know, shit does hit the fan, everyone's doing what they need to do to get stuff done right. I think, you know, there's a couple of times where like, you know, we tried to do, we planned it one way and I'm like, ah, shit, we, we could have done it better, a different way. Like there's a rock slide in episode 113, which is what premiered after the uh, the football, the big football game last weekend. And uh, or it was like two weekends ago. And we tried to sim it at first, which would have worked perfectly. But then I realized, well, we don't really have the time. And they wanted very specific bounces on the rock. And then at that point it was like, OK, we're going to change directions. We're going to animate the first bunch of shots. And then let's have the animate uh, the dynamics just do all the secondary stuff. So we'll animate it rolling down the hill, going through where a tree is supposed to be, and then let the dynamics guy do the tree versus having him first trying to sim the rock and do all of that. Because I think in a movie world, that would have been the correct approach. But on our schedule, we just didn't have the time to do the sim and to get the sim where we needed it to be and hit all the beats that the editor and the producers and the director, everyone wanted. So. You know, that's probably one of the few times we kind of changed course afterwards, but it actually worked out great because then they even had some pretty last minute changes on two shots. But then because it was an animation now, we were able to like mm -hmm. retweak an animation and render out the shot within like three hours and re-deliver the shot. Wow. And if that was a sim, it would have been like, you guys aren't going to get that change. That was cool because we were able to, again, just you know, like our whole job is we just want to try to make them happy. You know, I want, I want we want CBS to be happy. We want Bruckheimer's people to be happy. We want the directors to be happy. And, you know, so all we try to do is just figure out how do we get them as much as we can? And how do I not say no? Because I hate saying no to people. You know, if I if I ever have to say no, it's like, I don't want to say no. I want to say, how about this instead? Like, we, if, you know, we got to at least have an option versus a shutdown. Again, because of that, it's like it's just created a really good bond with the whole host team because they know we're working with them on everything. And it's because it's all kind of in the CBS family, like everyone's trying to make it work, you know, versus vendors that are all being defensive of themselves and protective of themselves. And you're having to always twist arms and stuff to get them to do things. It's been a very different experience on this, which has been really pretty calming and ref refreshing, I have to say. I was going to bring that up actually about um, as a production side soup, it sounds like you are more leaning on CBS VFX uh, rather than looking for any external vendors. So is that the case that there weren't any other external vendors on, on the show or? Probably just only been about two sequences we farmed out, but it's still farmed out through us. So it's like it all runs through through CBS VFX. So that way, kind of similar how like ILM does stuff, right? Where they'll take a job, but they have they have some other you know, sub vendors that they work with, but then they guarantee the quality and they make sure it all yeah, you know, meshes up with what it should be. Yeah. Very similar situation on this, you know, where it's like the same sort of idea where we can bring it in. And, you know, look, we have vendors for doing roto, some vendors for camera track. We have like, you know, so there's some sub vendors that we use, but the core team is mostly out of LA. And, you know, but, you know, but that's part of my job is then balancing that and figure out, okay, we're going to send this here, we're going to send that there. But, you know, it all comes in 
you know, through our pipeline, you know, so it all so to the client, it's invisible, you know, and it's like, and that's my job to make sure everything lines up correctly between everyone. But, you know, but honestly, I mean, we're doing CBS VFX is doing, you know, 99% of the work. There's a, uh, a production has created an in-house or they have an in-house vendor basically that's doing like monitor comps, phone comps, you know, simple wire removals, basically things not to tie us up, you know, so that that way we can focus on the big hard stuff. And then they have their sort of their own little company that assists editorial for any of that sort of, you know, like those sort of shots, camera shakes, you know, simple things. So that way, you know, we can do a little bit of divide and conquer on the episodes. And if there's any last minute fixes, we, you know, we either help them out or they can take over a shot or whatever. I love that. From your experience on working on so many feature films, like how does TV episodics, especially 2023 with real budgets and very ambitious shows, like let's say going back to X-Files to, to go all the way back, um, it's a whole different world back then where budgets are quite crippled. But obviously these days, um, feature films uh, have a, a pretty amazing budget, but so do episodics. Some shows you get a million dollars for post alone. Yeah, for you, what do you find are the big differences between working on a TV show like Fire Country versus let's say a traditional feature film? Well, look, the budgets are definitely tight, but you know, one of the advantages because CBS VFX, because it's all within the CBS family, there's a lot, there's a lot of advantages to the productions to use the, basically the in-house VFX company versus an outside company that has additional markups and obviously they want to make money and there's like all these other things. So it gives us a great competitive advantage, uh, you know, in that regard. But, you know, like one of the things we have to look at is, yeah, like, look, it, the, the budgets are good, but then you're also still doing 170 shots. So you can look at the number of the budget, but then you divide it by the number of shots. And it's like, that's a, you know, that's still, there's a lot of stuff happening there. So we've been, you know, our whole thing. And I, look, and I think it's how we always ran hydraulics. Like we always did more with less people, you know, where we had, you know, 40 people in our 3D department, you know, we're competing against companies that had a thousand people in our 3D department. It's like, we've always been a force multiplier. And I think, and that's one of the things I've been trying to bring to CBS is like that idea of, yeah, I don't need 50 animators. I don't need 30 dynamics people. Like if we're really, really smart, we can have like two dynamics people. And if, and if we stat, if we actually, you know, sequence everything correctly and we sequence the modeling and we sequence the animation and we get better publishing tools and, and better notes and annotations and the way we manage people is better. We can do double, triple the work for the number of people we actually have. And that's how we've been stretching the budget on this show is that, you know, I think that if you took the same budget and went to some other third party vendor, you probably would get half the amount of stuff, maybe even less. You know, and it's and it's also again because this is like an in the family sort of thing. It's like, you know, there's we have no other motivation other than to make this show awesome. You know, so it's like versus you know, like if you're a company, and you're worried about some big studio putting you out of business because they're killing you with notes or don't want to pay overages or like all that kind of crazy stuff. So like you, we just don't have that level of dynamics. So it's just really about making it look good you know, being smart about it. And then look, we've also been leveraging AI. We've been using AI stuff for beauty work. One of the things we haven't done on this show, but I know CBS VFX has been developing a bunch of stuff with their virtual set stage and a lot of Unreal. And probably one of the things I'd maybe want to look at on season two is starting to leverage Unreal for trying to get more real-time rendering. So, you know, we're using V-Ray right now, which is, you know, pretty quick. It's much faster than the metal ray we used to use back in the day. The metal ray. That yeah. shit was slow. Uh, but it's still like, you know, it's not the fastest thing, but you know, if we could get all of our helicopters and all the vehicles into Unreal and then get an Unreal render pipeline set up, you know, that's going to be a huge game changer. And, you know, so that those, there's a couple things like that I want to look into for season two, when we have our couple month break between the season starting up is trying to figure out, okay, how, what things can we strip out of our V-Ray pipeline? Can we bring more Unreal in? Can we get, you know, more rendering? So I don't have to like, especially in the dynamics, like I, I want to give the dynamics people, you know, the, all the machines we can, 
but I don't want them bogged down rendering, you know, a helicopter that you could probably render in almost real time in Unreal, or it's 15 minutes of frame in V-Ray. Yeah, like, so it's going to be like a lot of efficiencies like that. And then also, you know, leveraging more AI stuff that we can start getting into for map paintings or other things where just will help us create more faster with less actual, you know, overhead and artists. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this honestly has been really great to um, to chat both about your, your whole career up until now, or I should say just scratching the surface a little bit. There's definitely a lot more to it. At the same time, like Fire Country sounds really amazing. Like what's next for you? I mean, honestly, I'm just focusing on the show and, you know, just excited about getting into season two. So like, that's like, there's, I think it's show's going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, we still got to do the last three episodes of this season, which are going to be the, uh, the, the real big ones. So there's going to be some crazy, some pretty crazy stuff. I think that's going to be coming up in these next episodes. So that's going to keep us really busy for the next couple months. And then uh, hopefully maybe a week off because I have not had any since I've got on the show. It's literally, we've, we, I mean, we pushed all through Christmas and New Year's. We basically pushed through Thanksgiving. I mean, it's been, we've been kind of just grinding to get this thing out. But yeah, it's, I don't know, it's also been fun. And that's the other, that, that's probably been the coolest thing I have to say is like the team has been so good. The client's been awesome. The uh, Dermot, who's on you know, the kind of like the supervising director on the show, he, he's been fantastic. Ted, the production, uh, the post soup, like all these people have just been awesome. So it's 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 been like this, a little bit of a Cinderella sort of story with just how nice and focused everyone is. Because you know we've all been on shows that have not been that way. So it's really ref refreshing. And the fact that I can even. You know, at a seven o'clock on a Thursday night, do this podcast instead of being stuck in dailies is also a testament to like how things like we've got that, you know, the machine's running smooth, everyone's happy, and we're just going to keep pushing forward on it. I love it. Uh, again, Colin, thanks so much. This has been really great to chat, and I'll definitely keep an eye out for the show. So, uh, again, congratulations on all your success. Awesome. Thank you.